Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you everybody for allowing us to join in today. Um, I'm really going to leave this to Jessica to talk about what Quiverful does and the amazing work that they've done for families that they did for us and then also the family, the future families. But um, when my wife and I were looking at starting a family of our own, um, we knew that adoption was going to probably be the path for us early on when we first started dating. When we actually started getting serious about it, we started looking at agencies and the, the cost in the U.S. really is just growing uh, at a rather rapid pace. And when we went to a couple informational sessions, we were just thrown back at the fact that a lot of agencies didn't even start talking to you unless you threw down $10,000 just to get your foot in the door and you didn't really know where that money went. They couldn't explain that to you. And so when we went to the first info session for an agency, I, I just walked away and told my wife, I don't know that this is going to be possible. And so we did a lot of uh, prayer and reflection and my wife got online and did just a basic Google search for low cost uh, infant adoptions and quiverful adoptions came up as the first hit. So we started inquiring about them and uh, the more we got to interact with uh, Casey and Elizabeth who aren't on the call today, but um, we realized that quiver, the heart of quiverful just really spoke to us. They do an amazing job of, of uh, one, being a low-cost adoption agency, but beyond that, they really strive to be an ethical adoption agency and in ways that are not just looking at placing a child with an adoptive parent. They're looking at the whole picture. They're wrapping around the birth mother or the expectant mother, depending on the situation, and they're providing services not just during the pregnancy, but after the pregnancy, and whether or not that mother decides to um, parent or put their child up for adoption, they're still wrapping around that birth mother and trying to provide them the best services that they can, whether they choose to take them or not. They're always there for them. And so um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jessica because she can tell you more about Quiverful and what they strive to do out there, what great job they're doing in South Carolina. Yeah, so first of all, thank you all so much for having me. This is super exciting and it's an honor to be able to be on this call with you guys. Um, but yeah, just like you were saying, that was our biggest concern when my husband and I started our adoption process was there's absolutely no way that we can afford this. There's just no possible way. And so after about two weeks of just kind of giving it to the Lord and just saying, I mean, we just can't do this. Um, Quiverful popped up on my Facebook page and we did our research and saw that their heart is for debt free adoptions. Um, which is amazing because so many adoption agencies and lawyers could really care less if you're going into debt or not. Um, but Casey and Elizabeth, they care. They care about where your money is going and how it's spent and that it's an ethical spending. Um, so yeah, I joined Quiverful. I've been working there for about three months, so not long at all, but adopted my son through Quiverful. So I know a little bit about them. Um, but yeah, just kind of how they got started to give you a little bit of background on our two co-founders. There are two adoptive moms. One adopted through a lawyer and her adoption was a, a little over $40,000. Um, our other co-founder, Elizabeth, adopted through self-matching through Facebook and saw that it's a lot cheaper to do it that way. And so they kind of got together, um, shared dreams and aspirations and decided to make um, a consulting agency. So what they did is they just only worked with adoptive families, not the expectant moms slash birth moms. Um, but then after a year of that, they realized that they need to come around these expectant moms and these birth moms and love them well. And they have done such a fantastic job. We truly feel like we raised the bar in that area by caring for these women, not just before they place their child and during that time, but even afterwards, um, it's not a you place your child and then we're done with you. No, like this is a lifelong friendship with these women. Um, we're able to do lifetime counseling for them for free, which blows my mind um, because that's not offered 
really in any agency. And then we do a monthly support group for them, which is awesome. They have community. They're able to really share their burdens and their loss with each other, which I feel is amazing. So yeah, they're doing really great things. Where do your adoptees come from? Are so we, yeah, so we work with all over the U.S. So we work with, adopt, I mean, we've had Texas, we've had, we actually have a family in Alaska right now um, who's looking to adopt, but most of our babies are from Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia, um, really this way, but we work with all 50 states, which is awesome. So I'll say that Quiverful does rely uh, heavily on Facebook um, and really encourages you to put yourself out there. Um, when you go active with them, they create a Facebook page and you basically run that as a separate Facebook page for you and your spouse to really get your, your name out there and your intention to adopt. And so the way you do that is you start doing posts and uh, Quiverful will provide you with a calendar and, you know, three times a week or four times a week, you'll post something about your wife or your husband or what you like to do together or your outside family and the things they like to do. And you really just start sharing that post with your friends on Facebook and you encourage them to get their friends to like your page and follow your page. And the idea is that one of these expectant mothers is sitting on the couch at home with a with their iPhone or smartphone, looking at Facebook, trying to figure out what they what their next steps are in life. And they come across your page from a friend of a friend, and they start thinking about adoptions. And every post has Quiverful's phone number, contact info, and then they can also contact you, and you can start the dialogue. And Quiverful's in the background coaching you educating you and also working with that expected mother, trying to get them on board to, to get the intake and, and pair you two together if that's the road you're going to take. So that's, that's one way that uh, this has been so successful for them. Is that right, Jessica? That's correct. Yeah, most of our families are matching through Facebook. And that's the way that we can keep our costs down. Um, the national average is a forty to sixty thousand dollar adoption, where Quiverfuls is anywhere from twenty to twenty five thousand average. So it's more than half of what national is because we are able to do things like Facebook and Instagram and really um, put ourselves out there through social media. Do I understand that you said that you still uh, continue to work with the birth mothers? If so, okay. how does that work out? Yeah, so how that works is we have two social workers on our team, and they really just start a friendship with these women from start to finish. They have their personal numbers, um, so they reach out to them weekly after placement just to make sure they're doing okay, checking in with them, um, building that friendship with them. And so we also do a monthly support group. So if the moms are local, so if they're in Greenville, South Carolina, or even an hour away, we Uber those women to us once a month for that support group. We feed them. Um, they do a lifetime healing counseling session, which um, is just a video, but it's from a birth mom, Ashley Mitchell, who um, is huge in the adoption world. Um, if you don't know her and you want to follow her, it's Big Tough Girl um, on all social media. She's amazing, but she works with these women um, every month. So, you know, it's hard after you place a child. It's not like it's easy for these women, and we recognize that, and that's why we want to um, stay connected with them and build friendships with them and love them well um, after placement. Okay. So the, the money that is spent by the adopting parents, mm -hmm. how is that divided up? Is that going for just legal fees or, mm -hmm. or does it go to some main conduit through equivocal? Um, you know, how does that work? Yeah, so I'll kind of give you a breakdown of what the twenty to $25,000 is. Um, so when you sign with Quiverful, our agency fee is $7,500. Um, that's just kind of what I guess Quiverful makes off the families, um, but that also includes profile books, pass along cards, all like making a website for these families, being in contact with them. That's where that money goes. Um, 
Then the rest, when you are chosen by an expectant mom, which is one thing that we feel like we do well, is we help pay for their rent or utilities and groceries, um, anything pertaining to pregnancy that a lot of these expectant moms, they don't have the money or the means to do any of this stuff. Um, so we're able to come along them and help them. So that's part of the 20 to 25,000. Also hiring a lawyer, which is anywhere from six to $7,500, I believe. Um, that is part of that 20 to 25,000 as well. So we've seen some of our adoptions only cost $7,500, just the agency fee. Um, but then we have seen some where if they're chosen early on, um, obviously they're having to pay rent six months. So that adds up to be kind of expensive, but. That's where our money goes. So are these hardship cases with the, the biological mothers or are there exceptional circumstances? You know, how does that work? Yeah, so we see moms from all walks of life. We have a mom who is very high up in her career and oh. that's just like what she's striving for. And so, you know, just isn't capable of, um, parenting her child. She's concentrating on her career, so that's why she's placing. We also have moms who are homeless, and they don't have a place to live. They don't have a job, and then we have some, we have a few teen moms, but not a lot. Um, most of, I think our average age for a birth mom is around 30 years old. Is there any kind of limitation on how many times a mother can use Quivical? No. So she can uh, place through our agency as many times as she needs or wants to. Huh. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Are, there other, are there other similar organizations such as yours around the country? There are plenty of organizations, but they are kind of, like I said, they're about 40 to $60,000 and you really don't know where your money is going. Um, most of them just take that check and they give cash to the expectant mom um, instead of paying like her landlord directly. They're just giving her cash to go pay it. And you don't know where that money goes. Um, so we're very strict on those kind of standards. We pay the landlord directly. If they're getting groceries, it's an Ingalls gift card. It's not like a Visa gift card to go get her groceries. Um, if her phone bill needs to be paid, we pay that phone bill directly where with other organizations, you really don't know where that money's going and if it's being used ethically, ethically. <laughs> you and Kevin are um, adoptee parents. Uh, how long have you had your children? So my son just no, turned one. <laughs> I missed it. Just turned one. So yeah. we're, uh, we're, seven, we're seven weeks into it. <laughs> so, yeah. So we, we had a little bit of a story, we, and I won't go too much into it, but um, this is one example where we really uh, cherish the relationship that we had with Quiverful during our uh, adoption store journey. Um, we were matched in uh, June of this year, and we followed the mother. We, uh, we flew out to South Carolina and went to her doctor's appointments a couple times from June to the birth in October at which point she decided to parent, um, which, was, which was devastating, but we also respect that. And my wife has maintained a very positive relationship with that, with that birth mother and still does to this very day, eight weeks later. The same day that she gave birth, we found out about our daughter who uh, had not been born yet. And so we wrapped things up in South Carolina with Quiverful. We were hiring an attorney in Seattle because our daughter was uh, going to be born in Washington, and we flew back, and she was born eight days later. Um, but part of that was also uh, what was so amazing about that was because our birth mother is located in Washington, it's considered an independent adoption for Quiverful, and what that means is neither party resides in in South Carolina. So we they were simply acting as advisors to us. We called them and asked them if they would do an intake uh, with our birth mother. And they said yes, without a doubt. And they, gave, they had a series of questions they asked her. Uh, they followed up uh, the next day with an email with that intake. 
and they even offered to provide services to our birth mother, who's not even in South Carolina, um, she, it should she choose to use them down the road. So, you know, it, it just doesn't extend to the the birth mothers that they work with directly. They they really do wrap around those birth mothers that you self match with. Jessica, uh, what about the um, health of the baby? I mean, prenatal is 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 important. How do you uh, factor that in? Yeah, so when an expectant mom reaches out to us, that's one of our first questions is, we need proof of pregnancy, and are you receiving prenatal care? I would say probably about 30 to 45% of our expectant moms, they don't get prenatal care. They just, I mean, you can push them all day long, but at the end of the day, we can't make them go. Um, we just go off, we do a medical social with them, so that's when we find out, are you using drugs? Have you had alcohol? Do you have any other kids? Were they premature? Um, any health issues there? That's really all the information you can get if the mom is not going to her prenatal appointments. And we can't make her go. Um, we do encourage it, of course. Um, but at the end of the day, it's her choice and her right if she's going to go and get prenatal care. How many adoptees are we talking about? So last year, our total was 52 um, successful placements. This year, we're almost to 60. And, like yeah, and again, national average with that is about five to 10 placements a year, and we're doing about 60. Mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of that's got to do with the lower cost. Yes, absolutely. And I think it, like these women too, they see that we care about them. We're not just using them for their child. Like we care about them. We love them big and well. And I think just our post placement for them, they see that this isn't a business transaction. Like we know the pain and we know the hardship that's going to come with it. Um, and I think they just trust us and they, I don't know. I think they really like to work with us because of our post placement that we give them. What are the statistics such as how many mothers to be ought to be using a service like yours that don't? I don't know that. Um, I think there's a lot. Um, you know, of course, just because I work there, I'm kind of biased to us. But at the same time, when you look at the table and you see what other agencies are doing and how unethical it is, um, you wish that every expectant mom would reach out to us so that we can work with them. You don't do any overseas adoptions? We don't, know. That requires a whole nother level of paperwork and things that we're just not able to do. Yeah, my next door neighbor has a child from China that was adopted. Oh gosh, how old is she? She must be 10 or 12. And wow. It's, uh, a wonderful situation for her. That's great. That's awesome. What do you see as the long-term impact of the mothers, the birth mothers, uh, continuing to interact with their kids? And uh, what kind of impact might that have to do uh, with the family or on the family? Yeah, so the way that we do it is we do not accept any clients who want a completely closed adoption. Um, our hearts are for open adoption. We believe it's best for the child and for the birth family. Um, so we want that communication to be open um, between both parties. Now, if an expectant mom comes to us saying we want a closed adoption, we do not want an open adoption, then of course we support that decision. Um, but we always tell our um, adoptive families, keep that door open. If she comes back, welcome her with open arms. Um, even like just little things, keeping letters, just writing down, um, he started crawling today. And so when she does come back, if it's 10 years from now, she has these memories, I guess, of the child. Um, and she just shows that you really care about not only her child, but you care about her as well.
is the uh, birth father ever involved? Yeah, so not often. Like in my situation, my son's birth father is involved. Um, he's not with the birth mom. They're um, broken up, but we still have a relationship with him as well. Um, we don't see it much. I would probably say like one in 15, you'll have a birth father involved. Um, some of the women choose not to name the birth father, which is her right again. Um, some do, and the birth father just doesn't want to be involved. So here's a question coming off of that. Are there ever married couples that give their babies up for adoption? Yes. Yes. Um, especially if they're just in a hard place. Like we've had homeless couples um, that just can't parent. We've had couples who have already have like, four children and they just cannot afford to um, parent another child. Um, some are just in really bad situations and it's heartbreaking. Um, but we do see um, very few, but some married couples who place their child for adoption. How extensive is the screening of the adopting parents? So it's pretty intense. Um, we require home studies, which means you have to pass FBI clearances, sex offender, child abuse, um, all of those clearances. Um, and you have to take it yearly. So in South Carolina, a home study is only good for a year. So if it, ex if it expires before um, your child is home, then you have to do another home study. So it's very intense, yes. And every little thing shows up on those home studies even like a driving ticket <laughs> is pretty crazy. They do a rap sheet, yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, so it's a pretty long, excruciating process. <laughs> good. good, thank yes. you. Yeah, these are great questions. Harold is our resident police officer retired, so. Okay. <laughs> don't, don't scare her. <laughs> Goodness. Well, I hope we're doing everything by the book, but I would say it's Thank pretty you. interesting. Thank you. Good. No, I'm sorry. I've been in and out. Is this a permanent adoption? Uh, it is, know? yes. Mm -hmm. So yes. a parent can't come by two years from now and say, hey, I changed my mind? That's right. No, once consents are signed, and every state's different. So in South Carolina, you have 24 hours um, to change your mind before consents are signed, but afterwards, it's a done deal. Um, I know Pennsylvania, I don't know if anybody's from Pennsylvania. I think it's a 48 day. You can, okay. So yeah, Pennsylvania, you have 30 days to change your mind. But after that 30 days um, and consents are signed, then you cannot just come back and take the child. No. So is that the same for um, father's consent when the father is named? So the way that the father is, is the father has to be involved. It, he has to show that he cares. Um, and that means paying bills. It means taking care of the, um, the birth mom. So up until placement, if he's like paying her bills, showing that he cares and wants to be involved, then he does have to sign consents. So my child's birth father did have to sign consents. And it's the same for him. He had 24 hours to change his mind um, or he could parent the child. But yeah, every state is different. But if they do name the birth father, then the lawyer by law has to go and tell the birth father um, that he was named as the father. Hmm. What are the biggest problems you encounter? With... Adoptive families or birth moms? Either or. <laughs> really not many problems with our adoptive families. I feel like they're all great. <laughs> um, I think just the biggest problem that we have is just um, drug usage, alcohol usage, um, just being kind of deceitful and lying about a few things. But I think that where we're different is we try to show these women that we do care and we're not going to judge them and we love them. Um, and then you can kind of start seeing a change in them when they start trusting you 
um, they start sharing things that normally they probably wouldn't share. But I would probably say that's really the only thing um, that is ever an issue is just being deceitful. Do you work with uh, babies that have fetal alcohol syndrome or drug addiction problems? We do. We actually have a lot of children who withdraw uh, from drugs and have to stay an amount of time in the NICU. So we, we do see that a good bit. You, you may have already said this. What's the oldest uh, child or children you've placed? I think the oldest was six years old. Six. We usually, like most of our children are newborns, but we do children. And so I want to say the oldest was six years old. Can I give up my 36 year old son for adoption? <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> That's funny. He's a great guy. We get that question a lot. <laughs> Here's a question you can explain. So when the couple comes to South Carolina to adopt, mm -hmm. how long do they have to stay in South Carolina? So it all depends on that state and it's something called ICPC. So most people who are coming out of town and adopting, I think it's a two week revocation period um, before they can go home. And that just means you have to stay in that state so our state can send the papers back to the state that the adoptive family is from um, before they can travel home and cross state lines. But we try not to have it over two weeks, but sometimes that happens. But it's nice when a family gets to go home only after a week. It just depends on how fast papers travel and how fast each state is working to get that family home. So are there states that are more notorious for dragging their feet than others? Yes. <laughs> um, South Carolina is actually pretty good at this. They're pretty fast. Um, North Carolina is pretty slow um, in getting their families home, and we've seen it be pretty slow for Florida families. They are usually there the whole two weeks if you adopt from Florida. Kind of a vacation. I know. <laughs> Which is your least popular state to deal with? Probably California. Really? Which is shocking. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think we have had one child from California. Um, I would say that's probably the least and most shocking. We're very busy in Texas and Florida, which is pretty crazy, but yeah. Linda, you're now a grandma. I don't know how many times, but at least once I know. How is this impacting you? Or yeah, about it. Uh, it's been awesome. Uh, our son Kevin and his, his wife are doing an amazing job with with her, and she's growing. She's thriving, um, overcoming a couple of challenges, but she's doing well, and she's very loved from all sides. She's got an extended family that um, the birth mama's family is pretty cool, as far as I can tell so far. I've met the mom or grandma. And um, they've met some of the siblings of the birth mom, and it's pretty cool. You go from this smaller family to a much larger extended family. I love that. Super. Yeah. So for us, our daughter has an older, uh, older sister that's almost three. And um, the, the, her, our, our daughter and her sister, um, their grandmother is watched, is caring for the older do uh, daughter or the older sister. And so for us, it was really important to maintain a relationship, not only with the biological parents, because both mom and dad are in the picture, um, but also her older sister and that she knows who her older sister is now and they can grow up together and know that, um, that they've got a whole family around them that supports them and loves them because adoption is you know, it's born out of brokenness uh, in some way, shape, or form. That there's always somebody in the picture that's suffering from a loss in some way, shape, shape, or form. So, to be able to embrace that loss and show the children that there's people that actually care for them, and I, I think it's actually Mr. Rogers. I was listening to 
a news article yesterday on the way home that said that his foundation really bases the, their principles on um, it, on the fact that if a child can be touched by one adult in their life that's impactful in a positive way, that child will flourish. Mm -hmm. And having an open adoption where you've got multiple family members involved for us just shows that uh, our daughter has potential to thrive just like any other biological child would if you were just to have your own. That's awesome. Do you have a program where older adults such as myself can adopt grandchildren for part time in the year? <laughs> that would be so <laughs> nice, wouldn't it? I need to bring that up. Yeah, I'm sure it's very successful. <laughs> my kids aren't producing any. Well, John, John, it's called babysitting. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> I think it would be a full-time proposition there, John. <laughs> would the you baby have an opportunity to reject John? Do I have the opportunity to reject him? John, yeah. Only we, John. <laughs> we do have an age limit. <laughs> <laughs> well, he rides an Indian motorcycle. Does that help? <laughs> yes. Big time. Okay. <laughs> Brownie point, John. Yes. Good luck, John. <laughs> but yeah, do y'all have any like questions about what we do or, I mean, y'all are asking some amazing questions. Do, do you ever get mismatches? And if you do, what happens? What do you mean by mismatch? Like a failed match? It, it just doesn't work. Yeah, so we do get a lot of um, birth moms who decide to parent, and we support them in that decision. We are their biggest encourager, and we, I mean, you have to kind of go into it as an adoptive family saying, if she decides to parent, we're still going to love her, and we're still going to be here for her, and we're going to be an encouragement to her. She has that choice. That is her child, and that child's not yours until those consents are signed. And so as an adoptive parent, we tell all of our families, go in knowing this is not your child until after consents are signed and just love her as big as you can, even if she decides to parent, still have that open communication with her. But yeah, we do see um, a good bit of, um, I don't like to call them failed adoptions, but um, we just say disrupted placements. Jessica, do you ever see uh, uh, expectant mothers who decide that the adoptive parents aren't the right fit before they give birth and want to change? Yes. Their adopted parents? Yeah, we actually do see that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's how are you showing love to that mom? Are you being in communication with her? Are you holding back anything from her? Does she feel like she can trust you? And at the end of the day, if that mom doesn't feel a connection with you or doesn't feel like she can trust you and really believes what you're saying. Um, she has that choice to say she wants to see different families. Yeah, we, we don't see it often, but we do see it. Yes. Do you do any work with orphanages? We do not do any work with orphanages. Um, we do partner with crisis pregnancy centers and rehab facilities. Um, that's really our extent. Um, we would love to partner with orphanages if you know of any, um, I mean, we try to reach everyone that we can. We, we, adopted, we adopted a little girl in the Philippines and we got her from an orphanage. Wow. Okay. I wish we did international adoption, um, but we don't. We only do U.S. adoption, so infant and domestic. Um, just because of all the paperwork involved. But that is amazing that you adopted from the Philippines. Yeah, there was 100 kids in the orphanage. We wanted to bring them all back, you know. Oh, I wouldn't be able to go because I would. <laughs> That's so neat. How old are they? She was six when, she, when we got her. Now she's 37. Wow. With two kids of her own. Wow. Grandkids, so. I love that. That is so cool. That's neat. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. 
Okay. Yeah. yeah, it was uh, probably a life changer for her, you know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. I'm sure she's thankful. Sounds as though your organization is reasonably well self-funded. Is that true? Yes. So we are a nonprofit. So we receive um, donations and everything like that. But yeah, that's yeah. right. What's the time frame from when a mother who wants to give up her child uh, does and then the adopting parents sign these consent forms are they is it a is it very yes so for instance my child's birth mom reached out to us when she was only nine weeks pregnant so we walked through the whole pregnancy with her um until after consents were signed 24 hours later um we see my but we so i self-matched through facebook but if an expectant mom reaches out to our agency, we do not present her with families until she is at least 16 weeks pregnant. Um, just so like we don't start paying for her bills until she's 20 weeks. Um, if she wants to see family sooner, we usually just tell people that, but just to make sure she's healthy and she kind of gets past that 16 week mark. Um, that's when we'll present her families. But during that time we're living on her well, but if you do match through Facebook like I did and a mom is super early on, um, you can consider it a match then. Does that answer your question? Um, sort of, but so is the adoption occur at birth or is there a time period after the birth that the consent papers are done? Does that, does that vary? Yes. So every state is different. So in South Carolina, the birth mom has 24 hours to sign over rights and her consents. Um, Pennsylvania is 30 days um, that she has to sign consents. So uh, that just means that if you're in South Carolina, you have 24 hours to change your mind. If you're in Pennsylvania, you have 30 days to change your mind before consents are signed. So every state is different. So, it depends on their laws. So those were the time periods you were talking about before. I wasn't sure what that 24 hours and 30 days was. So it's after that's right. Yeah, the yes, that's how long they have to change their mind. Mm -hmm. So um, if they change their minds, but so let's say it's a state that's a 24 hour time period. Mm -hmm. Does that mean birth mother has 24 hours to give the child up or, um, or is it, is it a minimum or maximum? Is there any maximum? Is that, so 24 hours is my question? I think so. So if she decides before, so you send somebody to get her consents, if after 24 hours she does not sign consent, she can choose to parent that child and take that child home. But after that 24 hours and consents are signed, she cannot take that child home. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So let's say she gives birth and two days later mm -hmm. she wants to give consent. Is it just, is it up to 20? 24 hours or can it go beyond that? I mean, no, it's depending on the state of hours. She has to sign before she's discharged from the hospital in South Carolina. So in the case of a, a state that's say 30 days, mm -hmm. does, she, does she still have that child or does the adoptive parents have it? And she has up to that point to ask for the child back. That's right. So in Pennsylvania, it's 30 days. So the adoptive families have custody of that child. But if before 30 days, she can always change her mind. So on day 29, if she decides she wants that child back, she can go and take the child back. Hey, Kevin, what kind of uh, emotions did you or your wife go through leading up to the process of adoption? Uh, I would say every bit of emotion that you can think of. I mean, it. it really pulls you from you know the extreme happiness to the extreme sadness and you'll experience it at the same moment sometimes okay. 
Jessica. You were talking earlier about uh, drug and alcohol use. Mm -hmm. Is there are there uh, blood tests or or is it just um, the adoptive parents or your agency witnessing odd behavior? How is that detected? So it is detected by what the expectant mom tells us. Um, if she is getting prenatal care, she does have to sign a HIPAA form. And so we can get all of her medical records. If she is not getting prenatal care, we have to go off what she tells us. But then we also do see behavior. Um, we're able to detect it pretty quickly if she's using or not. How often do you uh, see the, that, that mother during the pregnancy? If she is to, local... To, yeah, so she's local. We see her a good bit. Um, our social workers actually will take a lot of our expectant moms to their um, doctor visits. So they'll go pick them up and take them because that's a lot of the excuses. They just don't have a way. Um, so we try to not make that an excuse. So we'll go pick them up. If they are not in our state, they talk to the expectant moms at least once a week. If they haven't heard from them, they reach out um, within a week. So there's lots of communication going back and forth. So Jessica, you talked about 16 weeks. What's magical about 16 weeks? That is just saying like a woman usually miscarries around, if she does miscarry, it's 12 weeks. Um, 16 weeks is just that kind of like, okay, she's over that hunt. The baby should be healthy and carried the term. Um, it's just to protect our adoptive families. Adoption's hard and emotional to begin with, and then a loss of a child can be even more devastating. Um, and just bills-wise, like we never want a family to have to start paying for bills before that 16 weeks, because then it can get extremely expensive. So that's just kind of like the magic okay. number. Jessica, you're very articulate. What is your background? My background, I worked in a jewelry store. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm a pastor's kid, so I did a lot of speaking in church growing up. Um, but yeah, thank you for saying that. Not one or both of you in Rotary. I'm, I'm not, not, no. We, we have well, a way to change that. that. <laughs> I've always wanted to drive a motorcycle. That's close enough. Yeah, I'm just terrified. <laughs> I can barely ride a bike, so. It's a lot of fun. Oh my gosh, I bet. I'll have to definitely try it. You can do it, I've only been riding for four years. Really? Yeah. What do you ride? A Triumph Street Twin, it's, it's a smaller, not a big bike. I have a Harley too, but it's a lot heavier than the Triumph is. Okay. That's but awesome. It's fun. It's yeah. not that It looks like fun. I get pretty jealous if we go to the mountains and I see people on their motorcycles headed up. So I'm like, one day I'll do that. <laughs> All these guys. Scott there is an instructor. He'll, he'll come out and teach you. Okay. I'll take him up on it. <laughs> It's a good way to put your child to sleep. Really? By riding. <laughs> I don't know. Put him in the side cart, maybe. Yeah. Well, let me tell you a little story. Side car. Uh, when my wife and I uh, were having our two sons, on both occasions, the night before she delivered, I took her on a motorcycle ride. Oh, my goodness. What? <laughs> that was so that's awesome. We're in our 30s, so that took off a while. He didn't, he didn't say you went down the really bumpy road either. No. <laughs> There's only one person that leads us down bumpy, muddy roads. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Anybody have any other questions or comments for, for Jessica? I may have missed this earlier. Is your organization just in South Carolina or are they around the rest of the country? Yeah, so we're like our agency is in South Carolina, but we work with all 50 states. 
but yeah, our main headquarters is just in Greenville, South Carolina. Do you do any work for uh, Canada? Anything we do. Work? Yes, Canada. We have a family in Alaska right now. Um, so yeah, we work with them as well. We have some members in Canada. I don't know that they're on tonight. Yes, we are. There you go. All right. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Of course, I'm in Florida, but... <laughs> How does that work if you've got a U.S. couple and there's a Canadian birth mom? How mm -hmm. does that work? Or you have to travel. <laughs> um, so, yeah, like we actually had a family in Germany that just adopted. Her husband's in the military. So they are placed in Germany, but their child was born in Texas. So they just had to fly to Texas. Um, I think they flew about two weeks before the due date just to make sure they were here and ready. Um, and I think they're back in Germany now. So, But they're U.S. based, right? That's right. Yes. So what happens if you have a Canadian birth mom and a U.S. adopted family or vice versa? Is so, that, have you done that? We have not. We haven't worked with anyone in Canada, but we can. But we have not worked with it. No. It'll be interesting to see Alaska, too, like how all that works out. But I there. would love to see some Canadian families. There you go, Bruce. Yeah. Give our information. <laughs> Bruce. Blair. Bruce is in Canada. Where's Bruce? Yep. Bruce is there. Yep. Bruce, Bruce is up here. <clears throat> He's on. I'm in Canada. Oh, that's right. Glenn is up there, too. Bruce is there. Yeah. That's awesome. And have a daughter who hasn't managed to get pregnant yet. <laughs> <laughs> Good Timing is everything. Yeah. That gives you plenty of time to pick out your grandma name. Oh, I got lots of them. You already got one? <laughs> oh, all right. Anything else for Jessica or Kevin? Terrific program. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I think you're doing thank an you. awesome job. Keep it yes. up. Thank you all so much, and thank you for letting me be a part of this. This was so much fun, and it was such an honor to meet you all and get to talk about Quiverful. Yeah, go out and ride a motorcycle now. <laughs> I will. I will. You're, You're, in the perfect area. Area. You're right in your foothills. It's a great area. Yeah. We got some good roads. <laughs> you can go to the BMW factory in Spart uh, not Spartan, it's between Spartanburg and Greenville. Yeah, and I live five minutes away from there. And they have a wonderful school of instruction. It's fantastic. Really? The Performance Driving Center, yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, I live five minutes away from the BMW plant. There you go. It's meant to be. <laughs> That's awesome. Cute. Okay, thank you, Jessica. And thank you, you, thank you for having me. I'll send you a link to the recording. Okay, that'll be awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, it'll be good. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. This was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Kevin for sharing his experience, too. Yes. Thank you, Kevin. I, there's awesome. a, I yeah, left a link. I put a link in the comments on the uh, City Church where Kevin and Lindsay attend on their blog is an amazing story of I saw a link in there in the comments. That's awesome. All right. Who wants to lead us in the right. four-way test? Chris hasn't been on for a while. I can happily do that. So the things we think, say, and do. First, is it the truth? The truth. Second, is it fair to all concerned? Concern. Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? And fourth, is it beneficial to all concerned? And number five, is it fun? Be fun? There we go. Awesome. All right, you guys. We'll see you next, next week. Next week, great right. week, everyone. Everyone have a good one. Thank you. Bye now. Linda, Bye. should we just hang on for the board meeting? No, we're going to do it next Wednesday. Oh, Jerry, move. Back. Did that work sure. for your schedule? Uh, I'll take a look. All right, okay. good deal. Yeah, we, Rory and Judy are gone, and it's just Brian's on service till midnight, so it just worked out better. Gotcha. Okay.
I'll stick it on my calendar for that. Okay, perfect. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next week. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye now. Bye-bye.